So being able to think about class and sort by class and not just race is a very powerful tool. And it's a critical skill to make sense of the world. If you think about it, poor people of every race in a poor community have more in common than someone of the same race who is a millionaire. Pretty clear. So to understand the story of America, you really have to learn how to follow the money. So the first thing to understand is self-described capitalist societies can include socialist institutions. Nearly every capitalist country has universal health care, for example. The Nordic countries also have free ed education. So capitalism is a spectrum, and it's important to understand how American capitalism basically represents the most extreme end of that spectrum by far. So if you're not operating with this understanding, then you're really not going to understand how things are the way they are. And it's important to remind ourselves of this and fortify our knowledge, even if we're already more or less aware of this, it's important to do. So why is it that America is pretty much the only country where you can't afford to get sick? Why is that? The universal uh, healthcare system in India costs every person about 1,700 rupees per year. That's roughly 22 American dollars per year for a universal healthcare system. Now I'm gonna show you a few things with a disclaimer that you should always double check and look into interesting issues for yourself. That would actually be the goal here. And uh, some of these are a couple years old, so there's always small differences, but this will at least put you in the right ballpark of thinking. So I'll try to be rapid here. Okay. This probably is something you can see now. All right. So the first thing to point out. Something naughty. The first thing is, uh, you know, if wealth was uh, in the US was divided equally, we would have $700,000 per family every single year. So now let's, let's, let's disconnect from how practical this would be for a second and just understand that this gives us a sense of how much money there is in this country, okay? It's more than any other country in the world ever in the history of humans. So it's a simple thing that we should really be able to take advantage of, right? In theory, the greatest country in the world having the most income, how can we use it the best? Should not be a racial issue. We should be able to figure that out. So next, so uh, you know, the median salary for male workers back in the day, 69 was 35,000. Today, it's 33,000. It's gone down. So is that a good use of all this income that we have? Um, meanwhile, if you're in the top 10%, it's gone up, up, up. So it's important to point out that things uh, are supposed to scale with inflation. So not only is not raising this median number a huge problem, but uh, by keeping it the same, it's actually diminishing its value as the cost of living and everything else does scale up over time with inflation. All right. So just going to keep it moving. Now for this next one, just look at the left-hand side. I know there's a lot here. These are five different tax brackets, 20% at the bottom, the next 20, the next 20, the next 20, the next 20. All right, so what this shows you is from the end of World War II, 1947, till before Reagan, every tax bracket increased their wealth over 100%, okay? The 1% listed on the right is actually included in the top 20% as well. They just separated so you can see that as well. So no matter what you were making in 1947, no matter what bracket you were in, 30 years later, as you've gone through your career, you're essentially making double what you once were. And this is growth way above inflation for every single tax bracket. And this is a depiction of the American dream. No matter what bracket you were in, if you worked hard, you could get ahead double your income. Now, then we get to Reagan in 1980, switched over your view to the other side. So this is um, a very different kind of uh, situation. And all of a sudden, not every bracket is going over 100% of growth. 80% uh, of the country makes less than $200,000 a year currently. The bottom 20% actually makes less than they did. So they've grown poverty, if you think about that. Um, and then you can see just incremental things. And look, this is even like an even distribution. It's almost like this was designed by a group of people who knows how to design systemic, uh, you know, uh, systems. Um, and then suddenly, uh, you know, there's a strong argument that, you know, the American dream kind of died with Reagan. It's never bounced back and that our generation has never actually grown up in the American dream because it was been engineered away from us. So this brings us to the next question. You can see the top 1% and how much they're making, right? Um, the next question is like, what should minimum wage be, right? So, uh, you know, just look at the blue line. There's no argument for minimum wage being lower than 1885. You know, that's the minimum wage that had grown with productivity and you can argue it could be higher in our American system. Uh, even with a light blue line, that would be a vast improvement to what we have. Uh, you know, that's if it had grown with average wages, but we can see that we're the red, where it's $7. Uh, now this has grown in some of these years recently, it's, but it's still, in Australia, it's like $20, okay? So we're, we're like less than half of what we should be for minimum wage, and that's ridiculous. And keep in mind, that's not just affecting poor people because every tax bracket is scaled up from there. 
So all the other tax brackets, all the other things you would be taxed would be higher. So you would actually, it would help most people just to increase minimum wage. So I'm almost there guys. So this is Trump's America. Uh, you know, 2017, 1% grabbed 82% of all of the wealth created by our country. Um, not to mention things like today where like 500 billion tax dollars just went missing, uh, you know, which is more than the GDP of many countries. It would certainly be enough to more than pay like multiple times over for a universal, universal healthcare system during this pandemic, but we just gave it to the ruling class instead. So uh, next, how do we tax that ruling class? How do we tax the hyper rich? This is probably the, the best thing I have for you. This starts in 1918, which was the end of the Spanish flu, our last pandemic. In 1918, we had finished World War I. The Spanish flu had affected a third of the world, uh, documented somewhere between 20 and 50 million deaths, uh, way more than now currently, but this is not over. And uh, you know there are estimates of 100 million dead. So how did we get rid of it? We rounded up the richest bracket. We taxed them. We said, hey, rich people, you usually make insane profit off of us. You can afford it. You're going to need to bail us out for a change, as opposed to like the 500 billion tax dollars we just gave to them a couple months ago with no oversight at all. Um, and, you know, this, then we get look to what we get next to 1923, we get to the roaring 20s, where the top tax bracket is making historically more money than they ever have before. And we start experimenting coincidentally with lowering how much we tax them. Oh, I wonder if they had an influence on that. This is also around the period where monopolies were being created and legislated against. All of a sudden, we get down to 1928, 1929, and then we get straight to the Great Depression. I guess that's just a coincidence, right? So. Uh, how do we get out of the Great Depression? Oh, 1945, we get the tax bracket and we tax the fuck out of them. Again, what a coincidence. It got us out of that period. This is the end of World War II. Now we're doing well. And we lower it back down to 70 for a, a period of years that seems like a good balance. That brings us to 1980, which is Reagan. So in Reagan, uh, he had basically one job, reduce that number from 70 even lower. It's never uh, let's see how they can uh, do that. Let's, let's enter back into that game. And so he brings it down uh, to 50%. He dropped it 20 po uh, points right away. Uh, and then before he left office with Alzheimer's, we know that Reagan had one more for us. He brought it down to 38%. Um, Clinton did not change that. Bush Jr. made it worse. And Obama didn't change what Bush Jr. did, even though he vowed to overturn the Bush tax cuts uh, when he was campaigning. So who's uh, disagreeing with this? Nobody. We actually haven't seen a single instance of increasing taxes on the top bracket since 1955. We're the only country who can really claim that. And it's almost like we have the secret code of how to get through tough times. It's almost like we've proved that this works in America multiple times now. So what about racism? These are my last couple things. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, what about black people in particular? Well, any healthy gro growing demographic should grow over time with uh, home ownership. You can see that hasn't happened in 50 years. Uh, this is a facet of institutional racism. Um, also, black unemployment hasn't gotten worse. It has gotten worse, not better. And look at black incarceration before the prison industrial complex. It was 604 per 100,000 and now it's 1,730. What a coincidence. All right, so uh, just on this point to you know to spur this kind of thinking so here's the effect of the prison industrial complex on all americans again ramping up during the reagan years as it was being created reagan uh administration decided they had to redesign slavery to keep american hyper capitalism going long term so they built the prison industrial complex and now that is a tremendously high proportion of this group that are black males convicted of nonviolent crimes. That's the majority group here. So we know that in prison, you work for an average of 33 cents an hour and it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So this is slave labor. And uh, you could also, you know, of course lose the right to vote ever if you're convicted of a felony once. So where do our tax dollars go as, our, as my last couple things? Um, so here's if you make $50,000 a year, you know, you see that the most is we pay 247 for defense. Actually that's gone up. Um, and then you can see what people are pissed off about Republicans like, oh, your, your food stamps and your welfare that amounts to less than $45 a year. Um, and then uh, $4,000 in corporate subsidies. So on top of all the things that we actually buy from them and all the bailouts we give them, each one of us is giving them $4,000 a year in taxes. That's probably a good idea. So Again, in India, everyone pays an equivalent of $22 a year for universal health care. So it's very possible to take $40 out of my defense payment or my corporate subsidies and move it over to a universal health care bubble. All of a sudden, none of us need to ever pay medical bills. 90% of medical bills are gone for every single American. No one ever has to lose their house when they get sick. Uh, you commonly hear Republicans trying to cut out this part about welfare and food stamps. Trump's actually lowered that. He succeeded in that. 
but you know, people are mad that we're paying $40 a year for that, right? So finally, just look at the, uh, to that point, look at the red line. That's uh, from 1980, since Reagan, that's how much the, the percentage of tax dollars for welfare and food stamps has been steadily going down. While well, you can see the funding of police and prison industrial complex, our tax money used for that, has steadily been increasing year after year after year after year. So this is what defunding the police is about. It's about taking some of that blue money and moving it over to the red side and expanding what that entails to education and other things. That's all I had to say. Basically, y'all, uh, just the last thing would be like maybe an analogy, you know, like so American capitalism relies on systems of subjugation to thrive and survive. And systemic risk racism is for sure a favorite tool of subjugation in American history. And we've seen it keeps most black people in poverty as we just saw. But it's good to point out that while racism is used as a tool of subjugation worldwide, in many countries, race is not necessarily the primary tool of subjugation. Many countries just exploit poor people directly, regardless of race. So the next thing to acknowledge is capitalism still depends on slavery today. Globally, the most important pillars of capitalism are still sweatshops in Asia. And in America, it's prison labor produced by prison industrial complex. So whether slaves come from the same race as the ruling class in a given country or not is actually less important to the ruling class because it's all about the money for them. And really capitalism just needs to find a way to exploit the poor, all of the poor, and it can uh, always rely on systems of subjugation to do that. So in order to survive, it really just needs to exploit the poor and race is one of the easiest ways to do that historically. But without a doubt, the history of this unnecessarily aggressive American uh, hypercapitalism has always been dependent on the tool of institutional racism all the way up to the prison industrial complex. And so the finishing analogy is capitalism is like sugar. It can certainly allow us to have rich, decadent experiences, but um, currently America is unhealthy and addicted to it. Currently, we're all diabetic. So capitalism is not designed to go unchecked. Uh, it needs to be regulated and have oversight for it not to devour itself, which has happened in history multiple times. And uh, what we're seeing is essentially no regulations anymore, less oversight than ever. And uh, you know, it's fucking over the majority of the people. If you, 80 to 90% of Americans are getting totally fucked and if you don't make over a million a year, you're getting totally fucked. So that's what I have to say.